This will be the National Alliance on Mental Health um, or Mental Illness, also known as NAMI, um, Rising Voice Symposium. And so I'm super duper excited to talk about this for two things. One, um, yesterday, I don't know if any, if you all were aware that it was actually Mental Health Day. So Mental Health Day is a nas- is recognized nationally in an effort to combat mental health, uh, to decrease the stigma, to um, normalize that it's okay to not be okay, um, and to hopefully encourage people to receive services. So I'm, you know, that was very um, empowering that yesterday there were, I saw a lot of posts on Facebook um, recognizing those efforts. And so um, the reason, the second reason I'm very excited about this event is I can't wait to see the keynote speaker because I heard that she's very knowledgeable um, and inspiring and uplifting. And that person is dot, 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 no other than Kimberly Wormsley. Woohoo! Yay! Got to give myself a pat on the back sometimes. Um, so with that being said, there's going to be a lot of conversation about mental health, uh, breaking the cycle, and destigmatizing. So I just want to kind of lay the course of the foundation, the course and foundation of this conversation by, of course, giving you all some statistics. So this is um, a statistic from NAMI that one in five adults in the United States at any given time on any given day will experience mental health. Um, in some some um, fashion or shape, one in 25 adults um, will experience a serious diagnosis of mental illness. That's more like maybe like a schizophrenia diagnosis or uh, a major depressive diagnosis because it is a more serious diagnosis. One in six <coughs> youth <coughs> in the United States experience uh, mental health on any given day in the U.S. And unfortunately, this is a very devastating statistic that suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst people between the ages of 10 through 34. I mean, that's very, um, very impactful and and very um, devastating that that many people feel that they do not have um, any other outlets and thus are um, committing suicide. So I'm just going to give a little introduction to what um, what is going to be said tomorrow. So let's talk about what we know about mental health. Um, I think that We don't need to further the conversations because we know that there are a lot of misperceptions. Um, There's some cultural insensitivity, insurance barriers, and social stigmas that causes people to not access mental health services. We know that. We know that um, in retrospect, there are urban myths that are there in society that sometimes prolong healing, um, sometimes the negative effects of the stigmas also increase the symptoms. So in essence, what I'm saying is, is that um, the further that you self-isolate, the further that you feel shamed, the more your symptoms can increase, like being withdrawn, being um, hopeless and the self isolation isolation and the shame and the victimization that can also that will increase as you experience the social stigma so the more social stigmas that people are experiencing the less likely they are to receive services and the more likely that their symptoms will increase and get worse 
Um, let's talk about like the systems, the systems that prolong healing, the barriers in these systems that prolong hearing. So we're talking about long wait time. We're talking about the lacking of experienced and trained therapists, um, inaccessibility, inaccessibility, individuals who do not have the inability to actually go to clinics and um, access mental health services. Then you have the professional burnout. So this is no shade to any entity, institution, or facility. However, many of you guys know that I actually have my own private practice and have had uh, my own private practice for some time. And as someone who is contracted with insurances, one of the things are the number one thing that people have said about some of the biggest um, agencies, not only within the county, but in the state, is that they don't have access. Meaning if they're calling and they're saying that they're feeling suicidal or they're depressed or they're anxious, they may have long wait times, somewhere anywhere between uh, 30 days to 90 days to even get in for an intake or, a, or an assessment. And then after that, um, they're not seen regularly, like depending on the symptoms, depending on the diagnosis, I may want to see someone every week. Um, because their their symptoms and the intensity of the symptoms um, makes me believe in my professional mindset that these individuals need intensive intervention. Well, what happens when these agencies and organizations do not have the manpower to staff um, or even provide the services that are required for those individuals? Again, <clears throat> it creates this stigma um, that their lives doesn't matter. It uh, increases their lack of desire to even go back. It's so overwhelming. So I'm coming in and I'm saying that I'm suicidal and I'm depressed and I'm having nightmares at night, but yet my provider is telling me to come back in three weeks. That is inappropriate um, and very disturbing, but it is the truth. Kaiser Permanente was really bad at at one point during this year with um, wait time, their long wait times for people to get in to, to see them. And so what happened is it was opportunities for people like me as a private practice provider to get a contract to be within their out of network providers. However, what 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 was happening is the out of network providers were being overwhelmed with individuals who were calling. So, I, at one point, I was given getting like five or six new referrals a week, and I just didn't have the capacity or the man power because you know I'm my own private practice provider, so I only have one person in the clinic, which is me. And I didn't have the capacity to to catch um, these individuals who were lacking because uh, these systems like County and Kaiser and Sutter do not have the manpower um, to provide those services <clears throat> to those individuals. And so what happens in retrospect is, again, if we're not treating the mental illness and the symptoms um, in the beginning, um, the long-term effect is the symptoms intensify, and that's not appropriate. That's not, that's not okay. So let's talk about as a community, as um, advocates, as leaders, what can we do to change this process? So a couple of things that I've been working on in the community is um, innovate, innovation, transformation, and creativity. And my favorite hashtag is healing the community one conversation at a time. So what does that mean? Innovation. So there are 
there are so many things that we can do as private practice uh, therapists, as um, a community to ensure that it's not that, you know, come into your therapist, have a seat, I'm in my chair, you're in your chair, and we're talking, because sometimes it does not work for a lot of individuals for different reasons. It could be a cultural issue, it could be a subcultural issue, there could be some mistrust. So sometimes a traditional means of therapy isn't effective for people, and guess what? that's okay. Let's create opportunities in a non-traditional means. Now, I want to say this very, very, very clear. Some of these um, specific treatment is not going to be effective for everyone. There is no magic bullet. There isn't no magic blueprint. There isn't no one size fits all to treatment because everyone is different. Just like, you know, kids going to school, everyone learns differently, but you got to find the middle ground. So this is one of my most favorite means of innovation in treatment. It's called teletherapy. Again, let me just say this very, very intentional and specific. Teletherapy isn't for everybody because sometimes if you have um, a high level diagnosis or intensified symptoms, you may need to see your therapist in person, okay? And that's okay. <clears throat> However, there are some diagnosis like um, acute stress disorder or adjustment disorder, or maybe you're just dealing with some grief and loss and teletherapy, tel- teletherapy meaning um, therapy through a very secure outlet um, online could be appropriate for you. And that's okay. Um, right now for me, myself, I use an online tool called Simple Practice, and that has been very, very efficient. Um, the affordability is there for people who have co-payments because it's not an in-office um, visit, so that could cut you down on your co-payment, but that's something that you may work out with your therapist. Um, online therapy or ther- teletherapy also it diminishes the barriers that people face um, in coming into treatment. So what do I mean by that? So you have the luxury of having therapy in your office, if it's confidential, uh, your room, your home. Um, if no one's there and that's what you, where you feel comfortable in having the, the therapy session and it decreases the stigma of going, you know, getting in your car and driving to a clinic where you might see this big mental health and behavioral health. And that's, that's stigmatizing. I remember I had a young man come to see me and this is not when I was working in private practice. I was working for county. And they get there, and they pull up in the in the driveway, and the client saw mental health, and he freaked out. He was like, why am I here? I'm not mental. Um, this is for crazy people, et cetera, et cetera. And he, it, you know, he was shut down. So there was very, not, there was very limited um, things that we could do. Because no one wants to see a client who's not willing, that does not work. And so we had to reschedule and kind of process the stigma um, and got through that. And then later on, the client agreed to come. But, hey, we had to respect his process. Um, Teletherapy also improves accessibility. Because let's talk about it. Sometimes getting to a clinic, getting to an office is not cost effective. It's not. You know, gas is what, uh, $4 a gallon? And so sometimes, especially in communities that are disinvested um, and people are driving three or four miles away, 
it it's just more cost effective to stay at home in the comfort <clears throat> of your own home and have your therapy session. True story. I have had people call me from Las Vegas, from uh, L.A., from Orange County, because they were not able to find a provider. It's huge. Sad. So let's talk about transformation in care. Huge. Um, so again, we're, we're talking, this in the course of this conversation is to talk about better ways that we as a community and society can provide services and treatment and destigmatize um, barriers in treatment. So I'm not saying that we re reinvent the wheel. Let's transform the foundation that we have. So been in the game for a long time, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know that majority of psychiatric emergencies res are resolved in our emergency rooms. I'll say that one more time. A significant amount of our psychiatric emergencies, a psychiatric emergency, are resolved in our ER, meaning that people will have a psychiatric episode whether it's anxiety or depression or um, auditory hallucinations, uh, visual hallucinations, whatever. And people will go to the ER first versus going to a psychiatric hospital and or an um, inpatient facility or an outpatient facility. What if we enhance our mental health system by providing intakes in the emergency room because nine out of 10, a lot of times people are not even realizing that they are having a psychiatric experience and or deficit, go to the emergency room and then you're waiting there for an evaluator uh, to assess your situation that can you can be in the ER for two hours, you can be in the ER for 24 hours, you can be in the ER for 12 hours. And so with that being said, because the ERs are very consumed and overwhelmed, I'm gonna tell you that straight up. Um, and so why aren't we shifting the way that we are providing services to incorporate <clears throat> more of a warm, warmer handoff between the ERs and the uh, outpatient in psychiatric care, a warm handoff. Cause I know that, I know that cause I do that. I know that um, evaluators are sent out and or deployed to the emergency rooms. However, the wait time, because there's probably, I don't know, maybe if, I don't think that there's, I don't, I'm not gonna give a number cause I don't believe in giving facts that I'm not 100% confident in. However, I don't believe as a professional, I don't believe that there's enough um, psychiatric evaluators that can go out to the ERs and offset um, and intervene in individuals who are um, ultimately seeking outpatient and interven intervention in our emergency room. So infusing more mental health interventions in our ER could mitigate, it could act as an intervention and a tool to ensure that people are getting the right directives to, um, to a professional. That's important. <clears throat> Here's a good one. Promoting mental health and wellness during mandatory screenings every year. So ladies, we screen for breast cancer, we screen for ov ovarian cancer, we screen for pregnancy, we screen for diabetes, we screen for high blood pressure, we screen for all these different things 
but we do not screen for mental health. That's preposterous. That's ludicrous. That's out of, that's craziness. And so if we are screening more, can we in fact guide more people to the right systems of care? I don't know. Let's see. Let's focus on recovery. When we begin to see emotional distress as an uh, opportunity to heal, we're changing the narrative. Okay. And we're seeing it more as a, an, an, an opportunity to heal and not a life sentence because People hear the term now when you are diagnosing people with uh, these type of diagnoses, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, (coughs) because there's so many stigmatizing situations. Um, Sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm shamed and, you know, don't talk about it or You know, I've had clients straight up tell me that they don't want to meet me in the office because they feel like when they walk through the door, there is um, stigma and and shaming and um, uh, misperceptions. However, as a community, if we're seeing healing uh, more as a, a life circumstance, right, Um, that we're trying to recover from and not a death sentence or a life sentence, then that can also reshape a person's desire for treatment. So when you get a cut on your finger, first thing that, well, I don't know about your kids. First thing my kids will ask for is a Band-Aid. So they got this big Band-Aid. Like sometimes it's just a little cut and about 10 different Band-Aids. So... What's the difference of having a Band-Aid on <laughs> and walking in society and, and versus you going into your therapist's office? Well, let's just be, you know, truthful. Going into your therapist's office will indicate some type of um, issue. And so, but again, if we're, we're looking at it as an opportunity to heal and to grow and to... Um, to enhance the quality of our lives, maybe we will get more people um, to actually access services than, 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 than not. Here's my, and we finally got to one that I really, really enjoy. Healing the community one conversation at all, or one conversation at a time. So we've already talked that... Um, that it is not uncommon for people who have mental health to not access service. As a professional and as community members, we need to be sensitive to the needs of people um, who are experiencing emotional distress. Um, And we need to be encouraging to services and interventions that are in place that may actually help. So um, about three months ago, um, when it was uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, um, I, it, it's in May, um, there was a proclamation wrote about uh, making Stockton a trauma-informed city. And something that I really, um, there was a sentence in there that I really enjoyed um, because it just made so much sense. You ever have an epiphany or something happen and you go, man, that just makes sense. And it, re- and it really felt good, insane. And um, it was a, a sentence that I wrote in that proclamation. And I said, let's start asking people what has happened to you and let's stop asking people what is wrong with you? Now, what does that mean? Well, you ever asked your young child or your 10-year-old or your you know, 12-year-old, like, what is wrong with you? And they say, I don't know. 
And sometimes as parents, we get mad. Yes, you do. You, you know, you know what's wrong with you. And it took me a while to understand that actually, no, they don't know how to explain it to you sometimes. However, when we start asking people what has happened to them and they begin to tell their story and their narrative about the things that has happened to them, then the pieces kind of fall in line. For instance, I'm going to go even deeper because that's what I do. Ask somebody, have you ever experienced trauma? Nine out of ten, they're going to say, nope, I never experienced trauma. And then you just started, you start asking about their childhood and their parents and, um, you know, their, 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 um, their, uh, their process as children, who they were raised by, uh, where did they sleep, what did they eat, who did they play with, how was their school experience overall, and they start answering those questions then it is at that point, then you understand what I mean. Because nine out of 10, they don't, people don't even understand that they've been experiencing a trauma. And so we have to be very intentional on how we um, are asking questions of our youth. We have to find a middle ground. Let's find the middle ground in therapy and be okay with the non-traditional way of accessing services. Granted, it's teletherapy. Granted, it's more um, incorporating spirituality, uh, um, you know, yoga. uh, um, Let's talk about shifting the mindset there are other ways to provide interventions other than just you sit right there and I sit right there. Again, mental health outlets and providers and services have to, they must be incorporated in spaces that they are not traditionally in. Why not have a clinic or two in South Stockton or East Side Stockton or the West Side or there's even areas on North in North Side Stockton that could benefit from having um, clinics there. Remember that we must start where the client is. <clears throat> it's not about you as a provider. It's not about you as a parent. It's not about you as a probation officer or a teacher or a professional. Let's start where the client is. It's called person centered. It works. <clears throat> Let's be respectful of um, people's spirit- spirituality and their culture and their non binary pronouns and, and, and their, their preferences. Um, in respects to their race or their um, ethnic of origin. Let's be discreet in how we talk to people and be sensitive to their needs. Finding the middle ground. You know, a lot of times there's this push pull sometimes, you know, where uh, systems are dictating what patients need instead of listening to what the patients need. That is unacceptable. So (laughs) I do want to talk a little bit about something. So I don't know if you're familiar with the R&B singer, Mary J. Blige. So Mary J. Blige has had, um, and and, I wasn't her therapist, but just um, some of the news that has been in, um, in the media about her struggles with addiction and relationships and domestic violence. And someone asked her, Why didn't she seek therapy before? And her response was, the paparazzis are everywhere. And she was unclear and unsure if she could trust someone with her intimate um, 
you know, experiences and feelings and emotions. And, and for me as a provider, I was like very taken away from that and taken away by that. And then I had to remind myself that I have to respect her process and her viewpoints. And I could see why she, she felt that way. And so as providers and communities, we need to respect the process of confidentiality and a person's uh, ability and, and process of healing. We have to work together. Uh, we have to challenge the way that we are providing s services to not only this community, but across the nation. Uh, we need to do better to ensure that there are opportunities for people to heal, for people to feel better, for people to feel safe. Let's create spaces. Um, let's continue to accept the non-traditional ways of healing and exploring other non-traditional ways of, of, of healing and treatment. How about let's start to advocate for quality of services versus quantity of services. So I'm, let me break that down. Quality, meaning I'm seeing my patient, you the patient are coming in and you're seeing me as frequently as you need without feeling shamed or stigmatized. Not, oh, I'm seeing 100 clients a month, so I'm doing my dual, dual diligence as a provider because it's not about how many clients you have. Sometimes it's about the quality, right? So we know that smaller classroom sizes are more efficient for students. Well, guess what? Smaller caseload sizes are more efficient, not only for the therapist, but for the patient who's coming and receiving treatment. It's time to respect the therapeutic process and interventions that are required for healing. Open dialogue and conversations about emotional distress and trauma. So it shouldn't be a shaming uh, uh, talk or conversation. It should be, again, where the client is, uh, a respectful and caring way of treatment. Some of, the, some of the things that I myself have committed to do is, again, um, I do a, a certain amount of time uh, pro bono in the community, and that's my give back to the community. Um, Coffee with Kimberly is one of my favorite platforms. Dinner and Conversations with Kimberly. Teletherapy is huge. Um, I've talked about emotional distress during an IEP or within an IEP process and trauma and uh, healing trauma through yoga and meditation. Again, non-traditional ways of providing interventions and services. So we've talked a lot about um, mental health and healing tonight. I'm going to say just a couple things. When we are looking at mental health and healing as a community effort, and we are combating mental illness and, and really infilling our community with interventions, we can make a difference together. When people feel better, they think better, they behave better, they feel loved and supported. And those are the things that we need to be saturating, not only Stockton, but throughout the state, throughout the nation, saturating people with love, dedication, commitment, and support intervention. Denzel Washington, one of my favorite philanthropists, said that either we accept responsibility for the way that things are or we accept responsibility to change them I don't know about you but as I'm driving through the community 
and I'm listening to um, conversations about the grief, the loss, the trauma, and how it has impacted our youth. It has impacted our schools. It has impacted our families. It has impacted um, individuals' ability to even go to work. I'm fully on board and committed to changing the narrative on how we feel about mental health. True enough, I appreciate that um, that recognition worldwide that happened on Thursday. However, I'm committed to ensure that those conversations happen every single day. Every single day. Thank you, everyone, for listening. It's been a real conversation. Remember, tomorrow, um, October 12th at Delta College, second floor of the uh, Del Rio Student Services, room 275, starts at 9 a.m. sharp. This is the National Alliance on Mental Health Rising Voice Symposium, um, raising awareness to mental health, about mental health. 